Let's open our Bibles, hallelujah, tonight. Good to see you tonight in the house of God. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians, and let's get right into the Word of God. There's uh, something that the Lord put in my heart today, and it's called the grace, the grace of giving, which is really the grace of God. Can you say the grace of God? You know, grace is, is God's unmerited favor. We know that by the Word of God. But also grace is God's ability. God's ability to come on you, the people of God, to do what we could not do on our own. Do you know that it's the grace of God that gives you the ability? First of all, mothers, it is God's grace that gives you the ability to become a mother. Fathers, it's God's grace that gives you the ability to become a father. There's power in the seed, and there's power in the womb. So think about that. He's given us power. He's given us ability, right? But then there's also the grace that comes on us to do things. You know, you, you're graced. You have an anointing. I want you to think about it. Say with me, I'm graced. We have an anointing, right? But the devil doesn't like that. The devil hates everything about you that represents Jesus in your life. That's why he'll do everything he can to get you out of that grace, that place. Kenneth Copeland says, grace is God's overwhelming love to, to love you, and to treat you like if you have never sinned. I love that one. God's overwhelming love is to treat you and to love you like you've never sinned. But see, the devil doesn't like that. So let's look, and immediately, let's go into 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Thank you, Father. I thank you. Say with me, I thank you. God is so good. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I thank you, Father. You're so good. Amen. Notice what it says here. In the fourth chapter... Verse 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I want you to look at, look at yourself right now. Just grab your, 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 your stomach or just your belly. Put your hands on it. I want you to think about that. This, this earthen vessel is a treasure that has the excellency power of God in us. You have God in you. I want you to think about that. You have God in you. I want you to say with me, I have God in me. Now think about it. You have God in you. That's why you have the power and the ability and the grace, the grace that God has given you. So you're graced. For God, for, for verse 5 says, uh, excuse me, for verses, verses 8, excuse me. We are... Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. I want you to look at that. This tells a person, it tells us that even though we have the excellency of the power of God in us, that there is a force that's working always against us. Look at it again. He says, we are troubled on every side. How many of you have ever, ever been in trouble on every side or feel, felt troubled on every side? But notice what the power of God allows you, but you're not in distress. Distress means stressed out. Perplexed in, in ways that you can't handle it, that you just want to give up. We are perplexed, but not in despair. And see, so the thing about the Bible promises us, yeah, even if you go through all these things, know this, know this, that He gives you the grace to overcome these things in life as long as you keep trusting in Him, right? So in other words, we have to recognize that. Now notice this. As we continue looking in the Word, notice this. In verses 10, always bearing about in the body, that's your body, the body of Christ, the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. Yeah, this is happening, but I have life in me. Yeah, the devil is attacking me in this, in this way, but I have life in me. See, the devil has to come to a point where he backs off because he recognizes that you know who you are in God. Come on, church. The devil backs off when you know when he knows, you know. But if you don't know, then the attacks happen. That's why you fall into these categories, perplexity, distress, 
concerned and worry. How many people know that worry is not a good thing? It, it literally causes a man to be dead or a woman to be dead. You can say this is a woman walking dead or a dead man walking, a lot, walking dead, you see? So in other words, these are the things about it. Now notice this. Is it God's will for us to walk in this type of trouble? It's not God's will because we live in a world but he tells us how to overcome these troubles in our life. Now, I want you to look at something. Let's look at something. Go with me to Genesis, all the way to Genesis. Now, we, we, owe, we owe the, the blame on our father Abraham, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, father Adam that gave away our right standing unto Satan. But now Jesus came and he became father to us all. And now we understand what took place. If you look, but the Bible says this, and notice what it says here. After, after they both fell, in verse 14 of chapter 3, after they both fell, they gave away their, their dominion, their authority to Satan. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Satan... Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Say with me, cursed. Above all the cattle, above every beast of the field, above it, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. So in other words, here tells us Satan here was not a creeping crawler until this point. I want you to think about this. And also this, 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 be, this, this evil being spoke. So in other words, you have to understand something. This is the power of Satan that had the ability to speak before it was ever found out that he spoke. Here, here we find out that he spoke. I want you to think about it. His speaking has not stopped. He's still speaking today. And this is what he says. He says, I'm going to speak to those that don't know their authority. Because the Bible says that when we know our authority, then we know our rights. And if we know our rights, we have victory. And Satan knows that. So that's when he speaks. Now, the thing about this was he, ca he was cast to the belly, meaning that he's cursed. So anything that is of the curse is not allowed to stand before your presence. Get, get a hold of what I'm saying. I want you to think about it. Whenever there's a curse coming, you have every right to say, the word says that you shall be on the ground. Meaning you cast it down. You cast down every imagination, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything the devil sends your way, if he sends to you perplexity, distress, worry, you cast it down in Jesus' name. Because it has no right to speak to you. The only thing that speaks to you is God. The only thing that will speak to you is Jesus. And the only thing that you, can, you will say is God's word over the enemy, over this area. But see, we have to realize that what we say is so important. So in other words, verses 15, we find out that because of their fall, he says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise it. Her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So in other words, he's telling us right now that the authority that God has given us is for us to bruise the head of Satan, to bruise him with our heel. And if you see something here, he goes all the way to Jesus. He goes all the way to, to Mary, that Mary had the authority to, that, to bring Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. And really it's a foreshadowing of the authority that Mary was going to bring Jesus and Jesus was going to come through a virgin and Mary had the authority to bring forth this birth. Think about it. She could have easily had Satan come against her and she could have fell down, hurt herself. But you've got, you got to remember something. She's carrying a child in her, birth of the Holy Ghost, but yet human being, but yet God. That's powerful. Now notice this. This is where the enmity is. Now, now, now notice this. Is it normal for women to have suffering pains at childbearing? Is it normal? Not according to the Word of God. According to the Word of God, it wasn't God's plan for women to have labor like this. 
But see, the problem here was sin that came that brought out that, that pain and brought out. So everything we see now is, is people say, well, that's normal. I mean, you're going to go into labor for as long as you can. But the body of Christ, the word tells us that it's not meant for a woman to go into these travail. So listen, think about it. When you hear about people saying, well, you know, oh, you're going to hurt, you're going to hurt. No, 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 no. No, in Jesus' name, he has delivered me from birth pain. That's talking, that's talking to women. So women, you ought to say amen. Come on, church, amen. Hallelujah. And the same thing that, that we have to understand. Now notice this. Uh, Christine doesn't like snakes. I know that because every time we go anywhere, we went jogging the other day, and I didn't tell her it was a big, big, big grass snake went across her because I know that she would freak out. But I told her after, so she doesn't want to go down that path again. And I told her, honey, do you know something that that fear of that snake is in the Old Testament that, that's enmity that God has put uh, against, uh, against Satan. That's why women, you have to know your authority. You've got to know your authority. And I thank God for women like Pastor Christine that know their authority, that know how to pray. How people know that women know how to pray? Women know how to pray. I'm telling you, you ought to, women, you ought to rise up and pray more because you have authority. And husbands, just back off. Let your wife pray. Let her pray. That's, what, that's why I back off with Christine because she knows how to pray. Amen. Because see, this is the key that God has given the woman at the beginning, but then Satan came in and moved it all around. But notice this, and unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception of sorrow, and thou shalt bring forth children, and the desire shall be to thy husband, and, shall, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. Now those says, you have hearkened to the voice of the wife and, had, and has eaten of the tree of which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now, now get, a, get a hold of this. The ground is cursed because of you. Now, was this God's intention from the beginning? No. It wasn't God's intention. God's intention was man and woman to have dominion in the garden and to live off the garden and to live off the blessing. And, and, and the thing about that was God was the one that planted the garden. It didn't say that Adam planted it. God planted it. So therefore, God brought out the most beautiful garden in all the world. The, the Garden of Eve was beautiful. And yet he put man and woman in it and says, you know what, I've entrusted you to take care of it. Take care of it. Just take care of it. Work it. And it wasn't for man to release the curse upon the earth. So in other words, Adam released a curse upon this earth. Now listen to this, church. I'm going to tell you something. This curse is still active. This curse is still here. This, this, this earth is cursed because this is the thing that Adam released and Satan is the God of this earth. So in other words, the body of Christ is on this earth. Now we're to come into this earth and replace and replenish and remove the curse. That's why every day of your life, where you are, your circle of, uh, I guess your circle, your perimeter, your perimeter, perimeter of life, where you don't allow people to come into, you want to start taking authority over that and let it expound, let it multiply, let it grow. Start speaking blessings over your area, in your neighborhood. Uh, start speaking. See, see, it doesn't have to be cursed. Your neighborhood doesn't have to be cursed. Your job doesn't have to be cursed. You think about it. If your job is full of people that are cursing and it's a curse and you're in there and you're saying, oh, I hate my job, I hate my job. We're, we got the wrong picture of who we are. We need to go in there and bring the blessing of God and turn that cursed place into a blessing of God. Can you say amen, church? I, I'm preaching louder than you're saying amen. amen. You ought to say, uh, you, wherever you go, you ought to release the blessings of God, the blessings of God, the blessings of God. Hallelujah. Amen. But notice as the fall brought this curse. Now I want you to look at it again. Thorns and, and thistles shall bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now, thorns and thistle is pain. How many people have ever touched thorns and thistles? It's pain. Come on, church. You know what I'm talking about? I have some rose buds, uh, rose bushes in my yard, and I'm telling you, they got some sharp, those flowers look nice, but man, they got some sharp thorns. And I, every time I think about it, it says, you're not supposed to be that way according to the word of God. You see what I'm saying? But see, this is a reminder of the curse that's on the land. Cursed is on the land. And yet, we, the body of Christ, are in this earth and don't realize that this earth has cursed, but we can turn it around. Now, notice what it says. In the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread. Sweat of thy face. Now, in the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for thou, 
thou art and unto dust thou shalt return. Now that is true. That is true, but we take it out of, out of context. It's not meant for us to have the thorns and thistles bring us worry and pain. And it's not God's will for us to sweat in fatigue and pain to try to make a living. It's not God's will. Now, get, now, now, hold, now, now wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. The world's taught us, well, working hard doesn't kill anybody. No, it does kill somebody. Tanja is this weekend, Tanja, from, from the Oasis Fellowship, is she's, they're having a funeral in Louisiana. I just found out yesterday, that little boy, Bo, that little boy got out to cut grass at 13 years old, and he died of overheating. He literally died, boom, dropped dead. And notice this, notice this, that brought sorrow, pain. But the thing about that, was it God's will for this to happen? It wasn't. Now, why, why, well, did the boy drink water? No. Did the boy take care of himself out there? We don't know. His mama did say something that he ate some uh, Chinese food and, and, and didn't drink any water, but immediately went out to, the, out to work. And at that very moment, just dropped dead. His heart just popped, just overcooked himself. So the thing about this is this, we have to recognize it. That means at this very moment, Satan, because of the curse that was on the land, cursed passed on to bring death. How many of us have ever been outside and we know better, right? Well, you, 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 you and I know better. We have to drink water. We've got to know when the body is telling us to stop, when, especially if you start getting some chill, or you, you, you start, all of a sudden you stop sweating, get inside quick. The moment you start getting a little dizzy, get out of the sun. God gives you wisdom, understanding. Don't go out there to try to fight the, this issue and this issue. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, the curse is still living to bring death, but God's will wasn't for us to get out there and to burden ourselves like that. Now notice this. I cut my grass. Uh, this morning I got up at 7 in the morning and cut my grass uh, and, uh, because I wanted to beat the sun and get ready for our convention. I missed our convention this year in person, so we've been watching online all day long and all night except today, so we're going to see it tomorrow. And that's where Sister uh, Lanisha's at tonight. She texts us and says, I'm in Fort Worth. Praise God. She met Pastor Abel Linda, so she's up there sitting with them, enjoying the service. But the thing about that was this. Uh, I came in, and Christine saw me all sweating. She said, oh, go straight to the shower. And I'm sweating. I, I, it, it feels good to sweat. It feels good to sweat. But the sun wasn't out yet. It was human ready. And... Uh, there's nothing wrong with a good sweat. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's, it brings up impurities and all that. But I enjoyed cutting the grass in the sweat. Has anybody ever sweated and enjoyed it? Has anybody ever sweated and hated it? Why? Because, see, you're now perplexed and in trouble because you're doing something that wasn't meant for you to do it that way. That's, I know a lot of people say, well, oh, I hate my job. I hate my job. Oh. And you're just burdened and overburdened and come home just upset, upset. I want you to remember something. Could it be the curse? Or could it be the blessing? Now, notice this. If it's the blessing, then you have a right to turn it into a blessing. Father, I thank you that this sweat, this sweat I received today was a blessing for me. I thank you, God. That it, that's a good job. You gave me a job. That's a good job. Even though I sweat, Lord, it's a good job. Uh, I get to minister. I get to bring a blessing. I get to, I get to enjoy it. See, see what's happening. This person now is turning her over and around the process of what, he, what could be the curse. How many people know what I'm talking about? I remember, and, and Bo does roofing, and I remember I did it as a young boy. I needed some money in high school, uh, excuse me, middle school. So I got a job cutting grass with, with a senior citizen. But he had some big grass to cut. Back then, we just had to push lawnmowers. We didn't have that stuff for pale stuff. So, and so we didn't even have weed eaters sometimes. It was just clippers clipping around the edge. Bo, can you imagine no weed eater back in them days? I'm really dating myself, right? And so uh, he'd pick me up, and we'd do maybe two yards a day. It was, it was they were big yards. And I hated it. I hated it. But I needed the money. Finally, my mama said, son, why don't you get you a better job? And then I thought, well, who's going to hire me? I'm just a kid. You see, you, see what, you see how the curse is working already? 
And, and the purpose that was out there was I needed money. So I was going to be in pain trying to make money. Now, notice this. There's nothing wrong with working hard, but you, if, you, if you understand it, if you understand that it can be a blessing if you turn it into a blessing. So then a guy from church was hiring some kids to do roofing for the summer. Roof. And so <laughs> I got on the roof. And in Texas, in humid weather, 100 and plus, 110. Oh, forget, forget shade trees. You were up there. I was already so dark. I mean, I was literally dark. And uh, I just hated it. Every time, every time we fought to get on the roof, I wanted to get on the roof where there was a shade. I didn't want to get up there. And then again, Mama said, son, get you a better job. I said, Mama, who's going to hire somebody? You see what I'm saying? You see how the curse was working there? See, if I had enough sense to understand the word of God, I would have said, wait a minute. I don't like this. So therefore, I'm not going to choose to do this. I'm going to do something that God's going to bless me. So Father, bless me with a good job, something that I enjoy. You see what I'm saying? You see what's going on now? Now, there's people that like, I mean, doing roof, Bo. I imagine if you like it, you do it. Uh, there's people that like doing it. There's people that hire other people to do it. But nevertheless, it shouldn't be a trouble or a plexity or a, 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 a hurt to you. It shouldn't be. Your job getting up in the morning and Monday morning should not be, <sighs> I don't want to go. You don't understand what it is. Then. But if you can ask God, God, this is the place that you've given me. It's a place that you called me to. If you know this is the place that God called you, now you turn it for a glory and blessing. It's not a curse. You see, that's why the body of Christ gets into what I just said earlier. Listen to this. He says this, he says, uh, uh, the Bible says, what do we, where do we say it was? In, in, well, in Corinthians, I, even, I, I closed it. 2 Corinthians, go with me to 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter. We are troubled on every side. Yeah, you're troubled every side, yeah. But you're not distressed. You're not going to start cursing the thing. Yeah, you may be in perplexity, but you're not in despair. Like this is life. This can't. This is not life. Life is in Jesus. If this job is not from God, then God, I believe that you will give me a good job, and I receive it in Jesus' name. So therefore, while I'm here, I'm trusting God that you're the right. Right. So in other words, this is where we are, because you have within you, verse seven. In your treasure, your earthen body, you have the excellence's power of God that is not of you, but of God inside of you. Can you say amen? Persecuted, verses 9. Have people ever been persecuted at, church, at work? I was going to say church. Yeah, church too. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but you're not destroyed. You may be dragging home exhausted, but as long as you know, thank you, Father, thank you for this job, thank you, job. You may be dragging home and saying, thank you, Father, thank you, but you're not destroyed. Now, that job can destroy you if you go into that job knowing that's a curse. Then you might as well recognize it's a curse and you're going to get destroyed. But if you recognize it's not, so go back to Genesis. So the Bible says this, verses 18 of Genesis, the third chapter, the thorns and the thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In other words, you're going to work so hard that you're going to eat your pain. You're going to work so hard that you're going to eat the thistles and thorns. And you know, my, my father, my grandfather was a sharecrop farmer in Austin, Texas, and he owned cotton he didn't own the property but he shared the property with an owner so they divided the the, the crop so but it was it was cotton and uh when i would talk to my mom she was raised picking cotton and we would have stories Just, i love talking to elderly people about the the past and she says man i tell you what when you pick cotton boy you literally you're you, forget nail ladies having beautiful nails forget that those thorns will get under that thing and your hands will be so, fingers will be so swollen. Every day you're doing it. Ah, you're picking cotton. Those thorns. You see what I'm saying? And thank God for the inventor of the cotton machine, right? 
But I want you to think about it. Before the cotton machine, there was, there was some pain out there. And let me ask you something. Thank God for the cotton machine that came, that God gave wisdom to someone to work it so that there was no pain. Now think about it. If you go back to the days of slavery, think about the slaveries, how they worked in pain with the whoop, with the whip, working, picking, dying on the field, masters just whipping them. Goes all the way back to slavery in the Bible days. Why? Because see, the sin now was in the land, the curse. Now notice this, the curse is still here, but yet it has a different flavor now. You're not working the field, but you're still working like you're working in the field. Are you all with me, church? You're not picking cotton like in the old days, but you're still having that suffering like they were in today's time because of the curse. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, he gives us the ability to produce the blessing on us. Now notice, it's the blessing. So in other words, I want you to think about this. Go with me all the way to Corinthians now. Uh, Corinthians, let's look at something here. Can you say amen? Are y'all okay, guys? Jesus is so good. Can you say amen? He's all the time, right? Father, I give you praise. I give you praise. Can you give the Lord a praise right now? Amen. Give him praise. Amen. Now, I want you to think about this now. Notice this. Now, in 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, I want you to think about something here. Here is a church that was literally poor. Um, they were struggling, living under the curse. Um, didn't know Jesus at this time, but now they're coming to know Jesus. Thank God for the Apostle Paul that witnessed to them. Thank God for the the ministers of the gospel that go went out there. Thank God, thank God for the gospel, amen? Thank God for the gospel, right? And notice this. It says here in verses 1 of chapter 8, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit. I want you to remember the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of their affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we, receive, we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. This is the key. And this is where the grace that comes in. They gave themselves unto the Lord un, and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desire Titus, here's the young boy Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace. Look at that word grace. Underline that word grace or, or look at that word grace, 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 grace. Go with me to verse 1 again. More brethren, we do... You to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of, of, of Macedonia. Now notice this. If we don't look at this word grace and ignore it, it's telling us something. Let's look at that word of grace again. In verses 6, In so much that we desire Titus that he has begun so that he would also finish in you the same grace also. There's that word again, grace. Therefore, as you abound in everything and in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence in your love to us, seeing that you abound in this altogether, Grace, come on church, uh, verses, verses 8, I speak not by the commandment, by the occasion of the fo forward, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to the poverty of the sincerity of their love, for you know that the grace, again say grace, of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that through his poverty, um, that through his poverty might you be rich. Might you be rich. Can you say amen? amen. Now I want you to think about this. Now what's going on here? He's telling us here is a poor church. A poor people. That found out that it was a curse now to be in poverty. Can you say with me amen? It's a, it's a curse to be in poverty. It's a curse to be in lack. It's a curse to, to go to a job that you hate every day. It's a curse. It's not God's will for you to get up and say, I hate it because what you're doing, you're cursing it. 
You ought to say, I thank you, God, for this job. Change your whole vocabulary, vernacular. Say, I thank you, God, for this job that you have blessed me. And it's not forever. You're doing something, God. You're doing something, God. You're doing something, God. Come on, church. I remember the year that, that I went to go drive for my brother. I owned, a, I owned a tone company, and I had to go drive for my brother for one year. The Lord says, I'm going to call you, and I'm going to direct you in one year. Okay, so one year. What do I do, Lord? Okay, my brother needs a driver. Okay, so I went to go drive for my brother for one year, and he has all these trucks and the trucks that we had. And, and so I, I just, I knew God was speaking to me because he said one year. So that job, although I, I owned it at one time, I almost started complaining, thinking, God, why am I driving for my brother when I owned it? When I owned it, now I'm driving for my brother. Now he's telling me what to do, and he's my baby brother. No, oh, God, wait, 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 wait a minute. I'm cursing it. What God has given me now, I'm cursing. So then I started realizing, Father, I thank you that you said in one year, one year, one year. It was to the exact date that he spoke to me that he gave me a direction. But notice this. That means the process that we go through, we have to understand it. You're the righteousness of God within you. You have this earthen, in this earthen vessel, you have the power of God that's in you. And when you get up in the morning, you have the power of God. So where you go, God is working in you to do good. Things are happening around you. But see, we don't realize it because we wake up, because we're perplexed, we're in distress, and we feel troubled, and we feel like we're going to die, and, and I hate it, and I hate it, and I hate it. I think that's the perplexity that we go through. I think that's the struggle that we go through, and that affects our worship. It affects our worship to God. There's people that says, oh, I hate this job. What happens? Then anything that pushes them to God, they're going to hate it. Because they're already used to being pushed into things. Think about it. Thank God that he's pushing us into his glory. Thank God. Amen. Come on, can you say amen? Thank God for that. Hallelujah. Amen. So we understand something here that this, these people found out the freedom and it's the grace. Say with me, it's the grace. grace. The grace, the grace, the grace. That through, that you know, verses 9, that you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through his poverty you might be rich. Think about it. I'm rich now because of Jesus. I want everybody to say that with me. I'm rich now. I'm rich now. Oh, I don't think we, we, we believe that because we didn't say it with all our heart. One more time. I'm rich now. I'm rich now. Okay, now, now, we, now we're getting there, right? Now I want you to start thinking about this. When you get up and go to work, now you understand something. I'm rich now. Not because of this job. I'm rich now because of Jesus Christ. This job, it's temporarily, if, if you believe in God for a temporary. And if you want it for your lifetime, then just believe God for a lifetime. Now, if you don't want it for your lifetime, you better start speaking about it now. There's people that retire doing something that they don't want. I hear people, I come from an industrial country, uh, state where there's industrial workers and people have literally worked to the grave in industrial things that they don't like. I knew a man that worked almost 50 something years as working as a pipe fitter in this thing. And he says, I finally retired and I hated all my days of my life. What were you doing there? Right? You see what I'm saying? This is the, where, the, where we can go if we don't realize it. You may say, well, am I always going to do this the rest of my life? No, according to the word of God, I have this earthen vessel. Uh, uh, this earthen vessel has the power of God in me and the grace of Jesus is working in me. I'm not no longer dependent on the sin of Adam and the curse that's on the land. I'm no longer going to sweat and perplex this job. I'm no longer going to think about it because God has blessed me. I'm rich now. Say it again. I'm rich now. Say so, amen. This ought to be the attitude when we get up in the morning, Monday morning. This ought to be the attitude Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, whatever, every day of your life. You ought to say, thank you, Father. I'm rich now. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Come on, church. Can you say amen? amen. See, this is what's going to bring change in our walk with God. You got to remember the curse is still in this earth, but you're not meant to take this curse. You're not meant to carry this curse. Satan released it. You're the body of Christ. You rise above curse. You rise above things, and you start calling those things which are not as though they are. I thank you, Father, that I'm blessed. I thank you. I, everything I have is blessed. I thank you my neighborhood's blessed. I thank you my cars are blessed. I thank you my children are blessed. <laughs> you just go on every day. Now, be careful. Don't curse it. Don't curse it what God has blessed. Don't curse. Don't curse it. 
People curse children. People curse their cars. People curse their house. People, come on, church, thank God for your house. I thank God for the house I have. I thank God for the car I have. I thank God for the cars I have. Oh, I thank God. I thank God. I, I got a present the other day, and I thank God for the present I got. Amen. Do you want to know what the present I got? I got a beautiful motorcycle. Oh, Jesus. I get in it, and it rumbles. <laughs> And Christy says, when are you going to take me for a ride? I said, not yet, honey. Not until I become more confident. See, I used to ride bikes a long time ago until I had an accident. And then fear kept me from it. And so the thing about that was the Lord says, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. So I said, Father, I would like to have a motorcycle. And one month later, he gave it to me. And then I asked him at that same table, Father, I'd like to have a boat too. Because, Lord, I, I like fishing. And, and, you know, I'm tired of just fishing on the side land. I want to go on the lake and fish. And you know what he said? He says, just believe me for it. So what have I been doing? I've been looking for boats. Now notice, by faith, by faith, by faith. Amen. And so the same thing works for my wife. She's believing God for a house. She's looking for a house. Believing God for a beautiful house. We're believing God for a beautiful church. I, hey, listen, we have a beautiful church. Let's say, come on church. You ought to just agree with me. I have a beautiful church. Amen. Hallelujah. Now notice this. I, 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 and you ought to be excited about that. Be excited that God has blessed us. I'm just living in the blessings of God because I'm calling it in now. For so long, I struggled. And I said, I'll never have that. I'll never do this. God, oh, God doesn't want me to have that. I was cursing everything around me. The Father said, you take, you take your authority. You call those things in. So I get up in the morning and fire up that motorcycle. I go around the block with that wind in my face. Oh, my goodness. Amen. And notice is the thing about that is it's the glory of God. The glory of God. Can you say it, man? The glory of God. Now, I want you to think about something here. Look at something here, and, and, and let's look. I want you to see something. Go with me to Proverbs, the 10th chapter. Proverbs, the 10th chapter. Proverbs 10, verses 22. Amen. Notice what it says. The blessing of the Lord. Not the blessing of Satan. The blessing of the Lord. My job is blessed of God. Say, my job is blessed of God. The blessing of the Lord. It makes you rich and he has no sorrow with it. That word soil is painful toil. Remember, he's reminded us that that same painful toil that was in Adam because of the curse, he doesn't want you to have it now. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich and he has no sorrow to it. Blessing makes me rich. Say with me, I'm rich because of Jesus. He blesses me. Amen. He blesses me. Now notice this. If you go back to where we were in, 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 um, in Corinthians. Go back to Corinthians. I, I lost it. Let me look it up again. Now notice what it says. Can you say hallelujah? Now notice this. In, in chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, this is a poor church. One thing they found out is what was going to make them come out of this lack was stop cursing what God's going to give you. And the way they found out was to release giving. They started giving unto God. They started giving unto God. Now I want you to, so, I want you to look at some. Go with me to all the way to chapter 9 now. This is where you have, to, you have to take the part of giving. Now this is the, if, I could, if, if you can just think about this, when the Bible was written, it was not written in chapters. It just flowed. It flowed, it flowed, it flowed. The King James put it in chapter form. So now we think this is the beginning of another story, but it's not a beginning of a new story. It's just a continuation of the first story that we left where the church was poor. Say with me, the church was poor. Amen. So in other words, they moved out. Now notice this, notice this. The Bible says this in verses 6, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Why is there fear in giving? Because the fear of the curse is still there. Because I have worked so hard for this, therefore I can't give it because it belongs to me. See, this is the fear of, of Adam. This is the fear of, of the, 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 the thistles working hard. Especially when people get older. Listen, when people get older, they get, they get, they get stingy. I'm telling you, el elderly people, they get stingy because they feel like, I just have to hold on what little I have because I want to at least survive the rest of my years. See, that's fear. 
Did you know that's fear? Right now, young people don't think about their future. Right now, they're just thinking about making money right now. They're not thinking about their future. But I believe if we understand something, our future is clear and bright in Jesus because our future is forever. If we believe this now that I'm young, and, and think about it. I'm talking to you guys that are young. I'm young too, right? Say so we make pastors young. And this is, that means if we, start believe, if we start believing God now that he wants us blessed, and then when we live to be 70, 80 in God, you'll be blessed even more. And see, what happens to a lot of Christians is, is they, 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 they don't believe it because they still see the curse. So when they get older, then they get a little tight in everything. Have you ever heard people say, well, I can't do what I used to do because I live on a fixed in income. I heard Christians saying that. I live on a fixed income. Well, who fixed your income? <laughs> well, you know, I can't spend money like I used to because, uh, you know, I don't have the job. So, oh, oh, so that means your job was the one that provided you the income? You see what I'm saying? You see, we all get it backwards. And this has creeped into the young folks where they say, well, I have to work hard so that I can save for this. Oh, Jesus, we have to realize there's nothing wrong with working but we don't go into believing that job is going to make it. I think we have to believe God. God Father, I thank you that, that you're giving me, you're causing me to work more, but that's, I can sow more because I'm believing God for this. See what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying? This is the way it works. Y'all ought to say amen. Y'all ain't saying amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If you say oh me, say oh me. If you say amen, say amen, right? Amen. All right. Now notice what it says here. It says here, but this I say in verses, in verses 6, he who, shows, uh, shares, um, he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. Every man, every woman, according as he purposed in his heart. So in other words, it's the heart attitude. It's not how much we have in the bank, it's the heart attitude. You can have $5 in the, heart, in the bank, but your heart attitude says, Lord, I want to give you everything I have, the heart attitude. Listen, when Jesus, when Jesus walked by that woman that gave her last might, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't excited because she gave everything she had. She gave her whole heart. It wasn't the might. People say, well, that's the might, and that's, the guy just looks at the might. No, no, no. God looks at the heart. Think about it. I want to bless God. Oh, God, I want to bless you. See, it's the heart. You purpose in your heart. So in other words, start purposing now that your heart is going to want to give more to the kingdom of God or to the work of God. You see what I'm saying? See, we limit God in the area of finances. And think about it. Money is the, the actually, it, it, you know, they say money is, is king. Think about it. You, get, you have cash. You can do a lot. People are not interested in, in credit and loan. They want cash. So think about it. That means God can increase your cash because of your heart attitude. If our heart attitude is not like it under the curse, then we're going to be expecting the curse to, to provide for us. Are you all with me, church? You're allow, you were allowing the curse to provide for us, and then we start thinking that we have to sweat it to do it. i got to work it. i got to do this. I, I, come on, church. I know what I'm talking about. we, we got to do this. Oh, i got to. I, I can't go to work. I can't go to church. I can't go to this. I, I can't go to this. I hear so much excuses. As a pastor, I hear so much. Well, we can't go to this party because i got to work. I, I can't go to that, that thing. Because I, gotta, I can't go to that wedding because i got to work. I, I can't go to the birthday party because i got to work. I, oh, come on, church. Come on, come on. we got to get real with this. It's not, it's not the job that we have to focus on it's the blessing the blessing the blessing the blessing i'm going to go because i'm blessed i'm going to go to this wedding because i'm come on church i'm preaching loud now i'm going to go to this wedding because i'm blessed i'm going to go to this party because i'm blessed i'm good you see i'm i'm blessed I'm, see it's the hard attitude i want you to think about it right now if we had a million dollars in our pocket how would your heart be in giving are y'all with me church why wait till we figure it out? Why can't we start believing now? Why can't we get the heart fixed now? So notice this. It says here that they purposed in their heart. I love this. It's speaking to me too. Every man, as he, as he purposed in his heart, so let him give. Let him give. Look at that word. Not grudgingly or of necessity. That word necessity means need. Do you know, uh, I learned something from my spiritual father's. Does your children ever tell you, I need this for Christmas or I want this for Christmas? Now listen to this carefully. You don't hardly hear a child say, I need this. I want this. Then why does the body 
or the elderly or us speak about we need things? Why can't we just say, Father, I thank you that you give me all things. So, Father, I'm believing you for this. See, it's not about needing. And I, this is what it says here. It's, not, it's, it's in the heart. Work on the heart. Thank God for the heart. It's not about uh, giving grudgingly, but of necessity. Oh, oh, excuse me. Or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. So, in other words, I'm giving because God loves me and my heart is, is, is prepared I'm not living under the, the curse. I'm not thinking like the curse. I'm not sweat. I'm not having uh, s th this, this, this problem of, of sweating, of perplexity, of <gasps> I'm so exhausted about this job. I, I, no, 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 no. I, no. I'm no longer this way now. I notice is you have the power to get out of all this perplexity. You have the power to get out of it. My mom once told me, why do you have that job on the roof? Yeah, right. Do I have this job on the roof? Why? I, I put myself there, right? Do you know something? The next job that I got as a kid, listen to this. I want you to think about it. I went to go pump gas for a gas station of a believer. He owned a gas station. And in that gas station, my job was to sit in that little fan box. I didn't have air conditioning those days, just a fan box. And whenever a car comes, ding, ding, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, pump gas. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Give me some more hours. I'll work. I was pumping gas. And then from there, uh, I learned how to check oil. And I'm talking about a middle school student now, learning how to check oil. Can you check my oil? I sure can. I learned how to change wiper blades. Can you change? I sure can. I learned how to change light, uh, the headlights. Oh, I, I. and then from there, uh, they said, hey, come back here. Why don't you learn how to fix flats? Oh, oh really? You're going to let me fix? Oh, I want to learn how to fix flats. So I learned how to fix flats. And then from there, I, I learned how to fix brakes. Oh, and then from there, I learned how to change alternators. I learned how to change starters. Oh, oh, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it, which I ended up owning my own business. And I ended up working, making money, fixing cars. Well, if you can see what happened was, I knew getting on that roof wasn't for me. Cutting grass was not for me. But I learned God gave me a job that prepared me for the future. Now, notice this. Now, the thing about that was this man that I worked for, we had Bible study. And so when we had Bible study, in fact, he, it's a long story about this brother Alva, Alva, but he would open his Bible. And we would have Bibles. So little did I know that God was teaching me the word of God while I'm learning how to fix cars. And then came the day where he says, hey, can you, can you open up on Saturday morning? I said, I sure can. Here's the key. You open up. I'm, you're gonna, we're going to hire some friends. You got some friends from school you can hire? I, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, I was opening the garage. I was fixing flats. I was running, changing gas. I was, it, it was just awesome. I loved it all day long. I might have came home smelling like a, a gas stick or whatever, but I loved it, right? Why? Because, see, I learned something in this message. Notice this. Now, the key about this was I learned also how to give. God is able. Listen to what it says in verse 8. God is able. God is able. Say it with me. God is able. Now, notice this. That word grace. God is able to make all grace. Look at that word grace. Verse nine, chapter 8, of verse 9. For you know the grace. For you know the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about the finances. He's talking about the blessings. He's talking about favor. For you know the grace. Go back to chapter 9. In verses 8, and God is able to make all grace, all this grace that Jesus Christ gave you abound towards you, that you always have an all sufficiency and all things may abound to every good work, every good work, every good work. God wants you to be abounding in every good work. Say with me, I'm a millionaire now by heart. Now notice this, that means we have to start thinking this way. I'm not talking get out there and go crazy spending things. No, no, no. I'm talking about get the heart attitude. Start getting the heart attitude. I'm blessed. I'm a rich man. I'm a rich woman. I see the blessings of God. I walk in the blessings of God. This job, uh, I thank you, God. It's a blessing. You have a blessing for me. God, I thank you that you have a plan for me. It's a plan. I'm not here forever. You're the one who makes me rich because of your grace. Although you died in poverty, you made me rich. And Jesus Christ, I thank you. I thank you. What's happening? You're getting rid of the curse mentality now. The curse mentality. You see what I'm saying, church? Because, see, the curse mentality will keep you sweating away from sweatless victories. You'll be sweating, complaining, bickering, fighting, affecting your Christianity, affecting your giving, 
And you may end up living the rest of your life under that curse. Does that help anybody, church? Think about it. I tell you, uh, when, I, when I understood this, I said, yeah, God. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that, that I'm not... Oh, I may be hurt in some areas, but, but Lord, I thank you that I'm an overcomer. I thank you that I'm an overcomer. I think I'm an overcomer. Amen? Amen. Come on, church. Amen? I may, I may feel like I've been kicked hard, but I'm not going to be in distress. Amen. You're my victory. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm getting off that roof, so to speak. I'm, I'm getting off that roof, so to speak. I'm going to the plan of God in my life. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and stand up, church. Amen. Come on, church. You, you break loose in this area. Break loose. Don't curse what God has given you. Bless. Turn, turn and call your job blessed. And if, if you think it's a curse, then, then, then get out of it. Run from it. Run from that job. If you think it's a curse, get out of it. You have no, no idea there. And if things are keeping you there because you, your inability, maybe your, your, your character or whatever, your, or your whatever, then you need to rise up above that and say, Father, I thank you. See, there's things that can keep us. I remember, speaking about cutting grass, I remember there's a testimony that I learned uh, of a young man that I met. Well, we, we heard at our, at our pastor's conference. This man was in prison, served 25 years in prison. And in prison, they gave him a job of being custodian or yard maintenance of the yard. And so he got out of prison. And, and you know, you know, your attitude of, of a, a prisoner you have a low self-esteem in some sense. But you got a word of the Lord. You got a word of, heard of Jesus. And in fact, got a hold of the word of God. And from that moment on, he asked the Lord to open doors. So was, he was living in Chicago. So they opened the door for him to start cutting grass. He was cutting grass. But his mentality was, Father, and he said this, Father, I have the mind of the Lord. I have the mind of the Lord. Nothing's restricting me. Nothing's restricting me. So he started thinking, you know, I cut grass for this man. I could start cutting grass on my own. What did he do? Bought him a lawnmower. Didn't have a car. Put a gas, gasoline tank on his, on his thing and went door to door in the inner city and started making money. From there, he started getting more yards and more people. More people started coming in. So in other words, by the time he knew it, when we met him, by this time he had old... He, owns a large, a large company that not only does yards, but does landscaping, does snow plowing in Chicago when it snows, does everything. And listen to this, listen to this. When he went up there and gave his testimony, he is actually millionaire. He's a millionaire. And he says, you know, the devil wanted me in prison the rest of my life. Not prison, not a prison physically, but a prison in my mind. But it was God spoke to me by the word that I can do it. So you, see, you see what happens? And Chris, you remember that testimony at the pastor's conference? Uh, in fact, he was the one that came and brought a million dollars to the offering. When they were, they were, I'm, telling you, I, I, I'm telling you, I've seen people. I've been around people. I know a millionaire has been a millionaire uh, uh, maybe three times. And, and we talk. We converse. The guy it, it literally... It is, is, is so wise in, in, in areas, but he'll tell you it didn't happen that way. It didn't happen that way. One day, as he was hauling, he was hauling these, these, these drill bits that, that go into the earth. He was hauling them, and he got so tired of hauling this. And, and he said, Lord, Lord, speak to me, speak to me. I, I, want, I want to do more for your kingdom. And one day, he delivered some pipe, and, and they got after him. They said, you take this pipe back. You see all these cracks in this pipe? At that very moment. The Lord gave him an idea. Invent a machine that will go inside these pipes and weld inside and then hone them. And then you sell these used pipes to the old companies. And he got an idea. He invented a, a machine that literally goes into pipes this big. It's a welder machine. First an x-ray goes in and then the x-ray goes in there and wells it, wells it, wells it all the way. And then they had this honer that just re -drew. Oh, my God. Companies are buying them left and right because they can't afford these new ones. 
I went to his yard and he says, he said, Pastor Robert, look, look at what God is giving. Literally a yard, probably seven, eight blocks long of nothing but pipes. And I'm saying, oh my God, truck driving, big old eight tailers pulling out trucks. Oh, I said, God, God, what you can do. It was just a truck driver hauling tubes. And one day just got, Lord, Lord showed him. Why don't we start thinking like, like the blessing? Are y'all okay, church? I think y'all ought to give the Lord a praise for this. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Amen. I think he's speaking to us. I think he really is speaking to us. I really, I think, I think he's speaking to us. I think in this room, we have the capability to, to rise higher than that curse and be blessed of God. I think if we change our, our vocabulary, and I know I'm re-preaching this, but, but I think if we forget about the curse and start thinking about the blessing, my job's blessed of God. When I drove for my brother, I, 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 knew, I knew, Lord, I thank you. You spoke to me one year. In one year. My brother's blessed. He's blessed. Why? Because, see, the blessing is still working. Come on, church. Father, tonight is...